All right, so our next speaker is Kate Isaacs, who is um, at the University of California, Davis, and will soon be a professor at the University of Arizona. Um, she works with us at Livermore, too, and she's gonna talk about MPI and Charm++ tracing. Um, okay, everybody hear me? Okay, good, so right, I'm going to talk about visualizing traces in MPI and Charm++. I'm going to start on the MPI side. Uh, that's something we've been doing a little bit longer, and I think it's a little bit easier to understand uh, what we're doing, both what we're trying to do and how we're going about that. And then I'm going to use that to lead into the changes that we need to make for Charm++. So first off, why are we looking at these traces? Well, we really want to understand how our code is running on the specific systems we ran it on, with the specific parameters that we chose. And so if we record things that happen during execution in time, this gives us the ability to look just at that. And we can maybe, if we trace enough, reconstruct exactly what happened and decide what to do from there. However, when we're looking at a trace, we have these really large logs from a whole bunch of different processing elements. So this gets really complicated. So if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, like exactly what might be going wrong, you're going to have to explore it somehow, which is one of the reasons that trace visualization has been pretty common. Um, so typically this is done via a Gantt chart. So what we're going to have is one horizontal axis meaning time and another axis meaning processes. In MPI this is great because the processes and the processing elements are the same, so we kind of get to visualize both at the same time. Each of these processes is going to have its own timeline that's going to show sort of the extents of the function calls that are made. Um, so we'll have one of those for each of them. And then of course we want to see the way that these parallel processes are interacting. We want to see the dependencies between these. So these are usually overdrawn as lines. So great, this is uh, pretty easy to understand. So if you want to take uh, your trace data, there are several tools that will create a visualization like this. So you take your trace and you put in your trace visualization tool and you'll probably get something like this. Um, Right, so, so there's a problem that though the Gantt chart is pretty intuitive, it doesn't scale very well. So once we take just a, just a like moderate number of processes, we're gonna get something that's very cluttered. Um, we can drop out those message lines, but then we've lost what those dependencies are. And we probably don't really have a sense of what those bars are either at this point. So the goal here is we want to create a different visualization that's going to scale a little bit better, and we want to do so keeping all of this dependency information, so preserving the patterns that we see. So to do this, we're going to sort of have a switch of context from something that's the straight physical time that we recorded it in to a sort of logical structure that's going to capture what we think we should be looking at. So what we're trying to do here is find the sort of intended organization of events. So this is our organized view. And then to do this, we're sort of shifting from the straight physical time axis to a logical timeline. So we're going to use that, that position to encode these patterns. So in this very small example here, four processes, the first two, they are these yellow send events. They're received by the second two with these green receive events. These overlap in physical time. Those receives are, are spending time waiting. However, when we think about this in logical time, of course the send has to happen before the receive. So they're going to be separated in logical time. So let's choose a slightly bigger example. So this is 32 processes. This is physical time. Um, as you can see, it's very intuitive. Um, so when we switch it to logical time, well, this is gonna detangle all the lines and realize, oh, this is actually a very easy to understand pattern. So now we can take all of those things we recorded and very quickly see where we were in it. We have that context back of what we were doing. Now, I'd like to point out that logical time is a little bit different from logical structure. We're using logical time to mean the timeline here, but traditionally logical time has been based on very local lamp where it happened before relationship. It's been very useful for debugging. There are other tools that do this, but we're doing something different. So we have this logical structure. So we wanna take into account the developer's intent, sort of what the idea of their dependency pattern was. We're gonna use this so that we can understand what our trace looks like. And of course, we had to do this using just the trace data. So this is like the magic mind reader program is gonna do its best effort to try to guess what was intended. Um, so here's a, a little bit more depth with an example where I'm going to show you a couple of the assumptions that we're making to try to get this intent. 
So this is an eight process trace using traditional logical time. It is a bit cleaner because I've taken all of the functions and made them the exact same length. So there's that. But other than that, it's really not telling you that much. So the first thing that we're going to do is say, well, probably nobody is programming their entire um, parallel application thinking of the communication structure as this one giant long um, set of communication events. They're probably saying, OK, well, I can think of this different phase of my program as doing this. Maybe somebody else is writing a different phase. Maybe there are iterations going on. And so when we think of those individual chunks, those communication phases, when we think of them sort of separated out, we're probably thinking of them as starting all at the same time. So if we were to find, say, some sort of boundary between phases, what we would want to have is a happened before between phases where everything in the first phase completes before we draw everything in the second phase. So once we do that, then we start to see, oh, OK, well, now I can see that I'm just doing the same thing over again. So I'm iterating through the same pattern. So there we go. We have this phase level happened before relationship. But then within the phases, what we're going to want to do is say, well, I don't want to just use the very traditional logical time that's putting everything as early as possible. Since this is MCI, I know that the sends are going to carry a little bit more weight in terms of how the developer chose to organize things. So once I do that, I'm going to make a few changes, and then all of a sudden we have something that's very well structured and very well understood. Um, yes. So now I mentioned something about having to know where the phases are. So sometimes like the user is very nice and will just tell us. But for the most part, um, we're sort of making a guess there as well. So let me tell you um, in briefly how we find the phases. So we're going to start with every phase equal to a single MPI. So clearly, we're not putting anything together that doesn't belong together when we start with every phase as a single MPI call. And then we also have all of the happened before relationships that we got out of our trace. So we have all of the messages. And then when we took the trace, we also had a long each processing element, which is the same as a long each MPI rank, the order of the events as they occurred. And we're going to make the assumption that this is the correct order from the sort of developer's intent. So we're going to have all of those errors as well. So then we're going to successively merge our tiny, tiny little phases into bigger ones. So the next thing we realize is, well, if we're looking for these communication phases, what we're going to do is realize, oh, well, sends and receives, the matching ones, they probably belong in the same communication phase. All calls to the same MPI collective, those belong in the same communication phase. So we're going to find those matching ones, and we're going to merge them into phases, like so. Of course, when we do that, we're keeping all of the other dependencies that we had in this big graph over phases. So what we end up with here is we're probably ending up with some sort of cycle throughout. And what that tells us is if I just stopped now and said, OK, I'm done. These are my phases, then I couldn't do that phase level happen before. I wouldn't know which one came first. So we're going to infer from that that all of these that um, create the same cycle probably belong in the same phase. So that's going to get us a lot of the way there in MPI. It won't always. So sometimes we're going to have to optionally take into account things like call tree information, or our belief that all of the processes should be active during a single phase. But this gets us there a lot of the time. So now we have this logical structure. And you notice I didn't really use any physical time information in creating it. So that's good, because that makes this process really robust. However, I said, well, we want to look at this trace so we can understand something about performance. That's kind of hard when I've taken all of the physical time data and thrown it away. So we're going to bring that back in the form of metrics. Metrics that use that physical time information as well as this logical structure. And one metric that we've had a lot of um, success with is this idea of lateness. So what we're doing here is we're realizing, well, in physical time, we might have two events that happened really far apart in time, like these two receives here. In logical time, they happen at the exact same time step. We haven't changed the order of everything. We have this sort of belief that, that in MPI here, we should expect everything that happens at that same logical time step might want to have happened at the same exact time. 
so we look at all of those events and we find the earliest one and we realize, okay, this one, this event, it's on time. Then all of the other events in that logical step, they are late. And we'll calculate how late they are with respect to that earliest one. And then once we have that metric, we can use a color to encode it. So you can see in this example that later process, the top one, is a lot more red. So here's a slightly bigger example, and this one's taken directly out of a screenshot in Ravel, which is the tool that um, I use not only to visualize all of this, but also to calculate the logical structure of the organization. The top is a view that's completely in logical structure. The bottom is a more traditional physical time view. These are completely linked. Um, on the top, everything is colored by lateness. I've taken everything between the communication events and I've aggregated them into single sort of non-communication ideas. The bottom, I don't do this. I leave all of the information about the computation events. Uh, those are colored in grayscale, so you can see their depth in the call hierarchy. So the top is giving you a lot better context in terms of this logical structure. The bottom is giving you more information, but at the cost of being hired to interpret. In this example, we see this one um, event in this first process. Uh, it's late. That entire process continues to be late. Other processes become late when they have to interact with that one. So lateness is a really nice way to see how things propagate along the trace. And then since we have the linked views, we can just click on that and find the um, where it hits in the physical time and look a little bit more closely at what that is. So we've had some success here. Um, one thing, logical structure also gives you the ability to represent a lot more processes without having to draw the line. Because once you, once you understand the structure, once it's very regular, you can just drop those and you still get most of the information. Or maybe you can just take the neighborhood of a single process. Or maybe you can cluster because all of a sudden you've got a very set deal of steps with which to do that over. So we've had some success finding performance problems here. So then the next question is, well, can we do something similar for time first? We would really like this logical structure and we'd be like to be able to figure out performance issues in it. So there are going to be some changes when we switch over to time plus plus. So we started back in MCI with this idea of, OK, well, here's my trace. I'm going to start with these MCI calls. And I have all of these dependencies. And we're going to have them along processes. Well, of course, logical structure in time plus plus is going to be in terms of time. So that's going to change things. We've broken that nice tie between processing element and process. Now we have chars, which can migrate, and they can be separate for a processing element. Of course, on the other hand, we're not going to have MCI call as our fundamental unit anymore. It's going to now be entry method. So that kind of helps us in some ways, because an entry method can have several communication events in it. And then when I figure out what the phases are, that kind of gives us a leg up. But finally, because I said we're breaking that idea that we have the single process and the single processing element, we're going to lose all of those happened before relationships that were inferred from the trace. So basically, all of those errors go away. We should be made up for them in having more um, charm messages. But the thing is, we were inferring those ordering lines from the trace. They're not actually in there because they were not necessary. And in MPI, we were able to guess that they were probably there. We can't do that anymore in time plus plus. That's not what we expect at all. And therefore, there's not really the tracing infrastructure to do that right now, because current tracing tools don't need that information. So there's no reason to record it. But when we're doing something that's trying to capture structure, all of a sudden, this becomes a bit of a problem. So when we're creating phases in time plus plus, we kind of get the opposite problem that we had from MPI. In MPI, we had too many dependencies. We were getting a whole lot of cycles. In charm, we don't have enough. So if these are my phases, A, B, and C, and the colors indicate which char each belongs to, then I don't know how to order those events within the char based on just this information. Now, I can start guessing based on things I know about charm, like maybe there's something in um, the yes tag that, that's going to elude that something comes before another thing. Or maybe if I'm starting phases, I can believe that the order of those events in real time will actually mean something in terms of happened before relationship. So I can add some, some dependencies there based on my best guess. So, so this might be the best guess that you would use if you were, say, using projection timelines to look at these traces. 
And then once I've done that, I can sort of look at where my phase bag is at now. Um, I see that B has one predecessor A, and then C had no predecessors. I still can't organize all of these charm events because I don't know whether A or C comes first. So if we think about how we did it in MCI, where we said, I have this cycle, I can't order these, so I'll merge them. This is kind of the same. I have no dependency information, I can't order these, so I'm going to merge them. So if we start with sort of the projection timelines, which are processing element by physical time, we also have a little bit more information in terms of idling. This is the same place in terms of charge. So this is charge versus logical time. The color here is just showing the phases right now. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how this visualization works. I've basically just used Ravel to try and make charm happen. There's still a lot of work to be done there. So on the top, I have all of my application code. Yep. I can order what happened to it in time, but the charm runtime can schedule it how it wants. So if I assume that that time order means something, I think that assumption is a little bit too strong to imagine. But no, that's a really good question. Right, so. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is what we're believing here. So each of these are actually logical timelines for each char. Each char is on the line. But because we're, we think about these programs in terms of chars, then yes, I believe that we should see more of the parallel patterns that people are programming when we do it in char space instead of processing element space. Right, we're gonna get there. Yes. But we, thank you, Todd. Um, yeah, so the thing is, some time, some, for some entry methods, ordering is gonna matter. For some of them, it's not, and that's what's going to allow the charm runtime to schedule things um, to best use the resources available. And the thing is, from the trace data available right now, we can't tell the difference between those ones that really matter and those ones that don't. We have maybe a lack of information right now. So we were inferring more information in the MCI world. And in fact, that's not a totally safe assumption in MCI either. It's just more likely to be. Okay, so I just wanna show you here that the bottom is actually all runtime chars. And we're just gonna stick them based on their processing elements because um, charm projection logs also will capture some of the runtime information. But since we're trying to get sort of the developer's idea of this logical structure, we want to separate that out. So we're going to keep those um, phases separate as well because we want the user to be able to view just the application charge that they want, but if they want the extra information, it's there. So um, charm, uh, the runtime will create a bunch of chars to implement some things that uh, maybe aren't so explicitly implemented by the developers. So this actual um, case is a contribute call to the QK reduction manager. It's performing that reduction. But like if you think about it in terms of MCI, that might all be collapsed into a single collective call and you wouldn't have um, as much detail about how that was implemented. Okay, so I've shown you things in terms of phases. Let's get into that ordering issue a little bit. Um, here's what happens if you just take the straight order of um, the chars once you have the phases. So we have this blue phase and this gray phase. This blue phase is a, is a mess. And the reason that it's a mess is not because some programmer thought, nah, and this would be the like best structure to program my code in. It's because like Charm has reordered this to make the best use of the resources it has. Then even in the gray one, which you see a little bit more structure, it's kind of imperfect. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take each phase and reorder the events by sort of imagining what if we started at the beginning of each phase and we assumed everything took the same amount of time and we assumed infinite resources, what would we get? And we would get something like this. So now what you see is that you can very quickly tell both of these phases are doing the same thing. 
and the patterns have been um, fixed up in the gray one and especially in the blue one. So now we have structure, but we're back to that problem of missing physical time information. We can't go back to lateness anymore because lateness assumed that along a logical step, you wanted everything to happen at the same time. That is definitely not true in time. I mean, you should be uh, over decomposing here, so there's no way that should be possible for all of them to occur at the same time. And really, you don't care where they're occurring with respect to each other, how late one is with respect to another, as long as you're using your resources well. So sort of the first cut where we're looking at, well, we can see where the idle time is in terms of the structure. So on the bottom, physical time, those big black bars, they mean idling. Then we can color to see who's being affected by the idle, and that's going to give us some context to where this is occurring. Now, maybe that's not so interesting, so we might want to start looking at things that can contribute to um, idling and imbalance. So one such thing might be to look at the duration of these events. So we take each of these communication events, we sort of figure out what computation in the entry method goes with them, and then we're going to do that vertical comparison again. We're going to say, well, at least in logical time, maybe we can make this assumption that all of the computation happening at the same logical step probably was meant to take about the same time. Now, if you can't make that assumption, don't use this metric. Uh, in this case, there's this, this one orange um, event that's taking a really long time. So we can figure it out with this metric. A slightly more interesting example, this is uh, Lassen, which is a waypoint mini app at Lawrence Livermore. Um, so here's just the physical time. We're seeing this uh, repeating pattern of this really long event, or maybe several long events, um, and a lot of idling everywhere else. But from the physical time view, I'm going to have to hunt a little bit more to figure out, well, are those the same entry method, or are they different? And which bar do they belong to? But when I look at it in terms of logical time, it makes a lot more sense because in the structure I can easily see, okay, this is the same place every other phase in application space, and it's happening on the same car each time. And this is going to be even more useful when we over decompose and have a lot more chars going on. And then we can see, okay, again, these are all happening in the same place over and over again. Let's look at why that's occurring. So I hope I've convinced you that like, there's a great use to looking at things in a context that we're all going to understand. It's one of sort of the intended um, organization of the developer. Of course, there's still a lot more we need to do. Um, we're working to get more information out of Charm so we don't have to make any guesses. So um, thanks, Jonathan, the funder, for a lot of help with that. Um, and there's still a lot of room for improvement in terms of visualization. So far, we've just sort of co-opted the MCI view to make this Charm view. But I think there's a lot of changes we're going to make to make that more useful. And also, we're going to want to organize things um, better and have a better um, interactivity for this system. So it shouldn't take you longer to um, hunt in visual space than it is to grep around in a file. And so I'd love to have more input on what is most useful to um, anybody who might want to use this kind of tool, um, what sort of metrics you might be looking for, so we can develop something that's going to be um, really powerful. Now, um, the MCI version of Ravel is up on GitHub. Uh, the Charm version, not quite yet. Uh, so that's the current status of things, and uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, so we can definitely try to find cases where that occurs and then sort of ignore that in the lateness calculation. We've talked about it a bit before. Or that has separate functions where there may be multiple things that you could have done where they would have been considered. Okay, sure. So the assumption is that the first one is on time and the rest are late. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we're, we're kind of making assumptions that look for a particular problem. Um, it might locate some things that are a bit different. So yes, we, we could find a way if we can classify them to prevent us from happening. Sure. Yeah, yeah, this is awesome, please. <laughs> Oh, oh yes. So, um, so one thing that uh, that we do do is, is like you know where the partition breaks are in terms of the function name. You can just tell us right away, and then we'll break it there and make sure that everything um, still obeys our, our believed rules about uh, logical structures. Um, oops, sorry. Okay, so um, let's go back here. Oh, I turned it off. No, I turned off the cursor, sorry. Okay, so, so the thing here is we're going to assume all of the events take the exact same amount of time. So there's going to be no latency over the network, and everything is occurring in lock step. Then we're going to assume it's also occurring on infinite resources. So if I send two things to the same star at the same time, they can essentially sort of go at the same time. Um, and then we're going to use that to reorder all of these to essentially come up with a sorting order, and then we'll go back to traditional logical functions. Are those also Oh, so that you can receive in any order? Yes, exactly. So that remember when I said we assume this happens directly before order? Uh, that that's not always true. That is the case where that's not always true. But when we have that, we can do something very similar to what we do here. Um, it, it has a couple more issues, um, but uh, it, it works pretty well. Okay. One more question. So I, I don't have as much, in, I'm not sure I get that in the trace information, and um, that's something I don't know quite as much about. It sounds like that should be taken care of by the phases, so maybe that could help me in the phase finding part, but um, but uh, I'm not quite sure about that one yet, but I'd like to know more. Okay, thank your speaker one more time.